Hello, and welcome to part two of NHC's Hotel Motel Conversion webinar series. My name is Luke Villalobos, and I'm the Director of Policy and Research at the National Housing Conference. Founded in 1931, NHC is the oldest and broadest housing coalition in the nation. Our members represent a robust cross-section of the affordable housing industry. Homelessness in America is not new to anyone. It's a multifaceted and deeply complex public policy challenge and one that was brought into clear focus during the COVID-19 pandemic. Part one of our webinar series, we took a macro view of how states were using federal relief money to implement hotel motel conversion programs to house our unsheltered neighbors. We showcased successful programs like California's Project Home Key, Oregon's Project Turnkey, and similar programs in the state of Vermont. Today's webinar, part two, we will focus at the project level and get into details of how to make these projects work, from financing the projects to ongoing services. Before we get started, I wanna give a special thank you to our board member, Nan Roman, president of the National Alliance to End Homelessness. Her enormous amount of intellectual capital, her generosity of spirit, and her experience with national homelessness has provided stage advice to us as we put together this webinar series. To take us on this journey today, we have Mary Tingerthal. She has worked in the affordable housing industry for 30 years, notably as the former director of Minnesota's HFA. She has recently been contracting with the National Alliance and Homelessness to develop case studies uh, for homeless uh, and for hotel motel conversion projects. Um, Mary, it's been great to work with you and um, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Luke, very much. And it's been a real pleasure partnering with the National Housing Conference and the National Alliance to End Homelessness uh, in doing this important work. You'll hear more about those case studies later in the program. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce our really impressive group of panelists today. Uh, we'll he hear first from Mercedes Brown. She's the director of the Michigan office of the Corporation for Supportive Housing and is also currently directing a special initiative for CSH on expanding supportive housing opportunities through hotel conversion throughout the communities that CSH serves. Julia Welly Ayers is Director of Housing Development and Finance for Hennepin County, which is where Minneapolis is located, where she oversees uh, single family preservation and financing of homeownership opportunities and multifamily housing, and recently launched an innovative supportive housing strategy for the county, which you'll hear about today. Kelly Ryder takes us to the West Coast and is government, government relations manager for the King County, Washington uh, Department of Community and Human Services, where she leads their legislative and policy efforts at the state, county, and city level. Going south now to Texas, Mary Margaret Lemons was named president of the Fort Worth Housing Solutions Company in December of 2017 after serving as their general counsel for two years. She was a, an attorney in the private sector before that and serves on the board of trustees of the National Public Authorities Directors Association. And as you'll probably be able to tell from her presentation, was named by uh, Fort Worth Inc. Magazine uh, as one of the most influential people in Fort Worth in 2020 and 2021. And joining Mary Margaret will be Matt Brugink, who is a partner with Ohala Partners, which is a privately owned real estate development firm in Dallas that acquires commercial and multifamily properties. It's an exciting group of projects, an exciting group of people. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Mercedes to tell us more about the initiative that CSH is leading to help other communities learn about hotel to housing conversions. Mercedes. Fantastic, thank you, Mary. Awesome, thanks for getting pulling the slides up on my behalf. Uh, good afternoon, folks. I'm glad to be here with you this afternoon share a little bit more about the work that CSH is doing across the country to support communities that are interested in expanding access to supportive housing through acquisition and conversion of hotels and motels. You can transition to the next slide. 
As Mary said, I am, my name is Mercedes Brown. I am the Michigan Director uh, for the Corporation for Supportive Housing. So in addition to overseeing CSH's a Michigan-based portfolio, I have the pleasure of uh, leading a national team at CSH charged with supporting communities across the country that are interested in, in uh, this particular topic and interested in expanding supportive housing through hotel and motel conversion. There's my contact information, and I imagine these slides will be available and posted. If, you, if I say anything that piques your interest and you wish to follow up with me, I don't hesitate to shoot me an email. You can transition to the next slide, please. A little bit about CSH for folks who don't have a ton of familiarity with the Corporation for Supportive Housing. Uh, at CSH, we're a national organization with regional offices uh, throughout the country. You can pop back one slide, thank you. Um, and staff throughout the country, even where we don't have physical office space, we focus on supportive housing and housing solutions to improve the lives of folks that are particularly vulnerable. We also help communities maximize their public resources through creating supportive housing. And our ultimate goal at CSH is to build strong and healthy communities. We do so through lending, uh, through our investment arm at CSH, training, technical assistance, and capacity building. Uh, as well as policy and consulting work. You can transition to the next slide. Now you know a little bit about CSH and who we are. I'd like to tell you a little bit more about this national conversion work that we've been leading, that I've been charged with uh, project managing on behalf of CSH. Uh, so CSH has uh, gone about doing this in a number of ways, or, or advancing work in the hotel conversion space in a number of ways. One being this community level technical assistance. And I'll highlight that a little bit, but I won't steal the shine of our partners and stakeholders in Florida, Virginia, and Detroit, Michigan, who are in the early stages of advance and well, at various stages of advancing hotel conversion work. So I'll speak a tiny bit about that. Uh, we also have advanced hotel conversion work through the release of some national products and resources, and I'll spend a little bit more time in this arena. Uh, that is uh, through the publication of white papers designed to help communities that are interested in this topic but don't really have a really clear indication around where to start. So we published a two white papers, one last uh, June and I believe the other early uh, last year. Uh, and then we also released in May of this year uh, what we're referring to as a jurisdictional readiness assessment and checklist, which I'll talk quite a bit about on this call before you have an opportunity to hear from communities who are actually really using those, this framework and, and advancing work at the community level. We're also planning to release uh, some more national resources, including but not limited to quality standards. Part of what we're seeing is there is growing interest in this uh, mechanism for creating affordable and supportive housing. We're seeing folks acquire units, and some of which are a little concerning. And so we think at CSH it makes sense to lift up our national dimensions of quality standards for folks to keep in mind communities to keep in mind, rather, as they are assessing real estate on the very, very front end. So we're excited to, to be at the tail end of finalizing another national product that will focus on quality standards and offer some guidance for communities that may be interested in understanding, you know, how to distinguish between a property with real strong potential to be adequate housing that would facilitate folks being able to thrive in place and distinguish that from housing that would, or real estate that would cost so much to bring it up to code uh, to, to create qu high quality units in the end. So excited to be able to uh, speak to that, but not very much because we're refining that product. And then the last way in which CSH has become involved in, in this movement to acquire and and convert hotels and motels to housing and supportive housing is through lending. So I'll just quickly highlight that CSH has lent on our very first project out of New York to create 133 supportive housing units. So it's, it's, it's always exciting to see that marriage of technical assistance and lending where CSH can be an investor in the brick and mortar of uh, developing uh, high quality supportive housing. What I'll say very quickly before I transition from this slide into the jurisdictional readiness assessment is the work that we've seen at CSH in Florida, Virginia, and Detroit. I'll back up and say that through a generous grant by Capital One, CSH was able to have staff in Virginia, in Florida, and in Detroit, Michigan work alongside our stakeholders in those respective 
uh, communities to assess their readiness and willingness and capacity to acquire hotels, motels, other types of real estate and convert them into supportive housing. Uh, those communities are at various states. Some have stood up task force uh, that are uh, that include folks at the county level, that include funders, that include other community stakeholders to design and uh, well decide on and implement standards for conversion to supportive housing in most of those communities. Others are as far along, like our colleagues in Virginia, as having projects. Uh, so I, I won't speak very much about the work happening in Florida, uh, Virginia, and Detroit, Michigan, because I hope that you'll have an opportunity to hear from those three communities in the future as they reflect on their experience of convening community stakeholders and partners and potentially uh, getting some supportive housing units off the ground through their collaborative work. What I will say is a lot of what I'll speak to momentarily around the process or framework for going about doing this work that CSH pulled together based on our observation and national experience is very much bearing out in those three communities. You can transition to the next slide. So very quickly, I'll introduce a national product that we released on May 5th with a webinar that we did that featured our LA County partners and, and a community in Vermont as well, which is our, what we're referring to as our jurisdictional readiness checklist. In this checklist, CSH lays out a guide for state, cities, and counties to, uh, that are interested in leveraging hotels, motels, and other type, types of residential and commercial properties to expand access to affordable and supportive housing and we particularly lifted up ways in which jurisdictions do that work by leveraging federal and state resources, namely the American Rescue Plan Act resources, as well as CARES. You can transition to the next slide, please. And there's a little bit of delay on my screen. Thank you so much. So this slide just shows a really high level overview in that jurisdictional readiness checklist that we released, which is available on our website. Our website will be noted in a future slide. We walk through these seven steps, or really, and they're not linear. I do want to throw a big fat caveat on that. We fully have observed communities and expect communities to be advancing work in these seven steps or buckets. Uh, in parallel, right, uh, especially if they're hoping to fast track uh, housing production through uh, conversion. And so we, we lay them out this way, but it's not linear. We kick it off with the evaluation of unit need, identifying permanent uh, funding sources, operating sources, service funding sources, developers, assessing and securing political will as well as identifying service providers. And I'm flying through that only because I want to be mindful of time and I have some future slides that dig in a little bit more on those steps. Next slide, please. But before we dig into the steps, I'll tell you that one thing that we think is particularly key that we've observed from our national work, both in, in, the, in the markets that I, I mentioned earlier, as well as other markets that, that CSH is aware of uh, that are using this mechanism for uh, developing supportive housing, these minimally are the four stakeholder groups that we wanted to make sure that we encouraged communities to ensure have seats at the table. So ensuring that you're often your government partners who are referred to in this as, on this slide as funding and entitlement agencies, as the folks who receive those federal and state resources that can and should be leveraged to develop supportive and affordable housing, so ensuring they have seats at the table. Obviously, your housing developers, right? We do call out those who are culturally responsive and have the capacity to take on moderate rehab projects and do so at, at a very quick pace because we're seeing a lot of this work turn around really quickly. We'd be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the need for communities to really be intentional around partnering with folks with lived expertise and experience. So pulling in folks with that lived expertise to help drive the community strategy that expands access to supportive housing and shapes quality services. I know there's been a ton of, of content pushed out in the last couple months around this topic, uh, not gone really, really deep on the services end. So we're thinking about prioritizing 
these units for folks with, with complex housing and services needs. Services uh, and program design are particularly important. So there's a good opportunity to learn from folks who have this expertise. And then the last group of stakeholders are obviously service providers. They can be those who operate emergency shelter programs or folks uh, and or folks who have a support housing program experience. Can transition to the next slide, please. And I want to be mindful of time uh, here. Time flies. I'll quickly hit on uh, these seven uh, steps. That's again just those uh, seven sort of points that we've rolled up in our framework. I went over those on the earlier slide, so you can actually transition to the next slide. The first slide focuses, or the first sort of quadrant focuses on evaluating unit need. What I'll say about this is for folks who are uh, in jurisdictions that are already using hotels and motels for temporary non-congregate shelter in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, we, we make the recommendation that, that, that you use the information around the number of uh, hotel rooms that you've taken offline or that you've uh, housed folks temporarily and to give you a sense of inventory. So collecting an inventory around what is available in your community by way of hotel and motel and uh, sort of crossing that against what your local need is. So leveraging your data, especially from those uh, at your local continuum of care uh, to better understand how many units do, does your community uh, actually need? And we make a couple of, couple of other recommendations around what communities should evaluate during this step. Uh, I'll leave them on the slide here. I, I just wanted to, to pull that one out. And we can transition to the next slide, please. At the stage of identification of permanent funding sources, I'll just call out that if necessary, we make recommendations for folks to access the availability of federal and state funding uh, for acquisition and uh, permanent housing resources, such as the uh, low-income housing tax credits and other long-term uh, funding mechanism to keep their, these projects adequately funded on a permanent basis. So we do make recommendations in that regard as well. We can transition to the next slide. Then we make recommendations that folks, as part of this process, be really mindful of operating funding sources. And we'd be remiss if we didn't acknowledge that we're hearing a lot from the field, like our partners in LA County around the challenges of securing both operating and services funding. So here, you, you won't be surprised to, to note that we make recommendations that there's a concerted effort to really get your arms around the availability of long-term operating subsidies, such as housing voucher programs, and evaluate the potential for standing up new uh, ongoing structural operating funding sources in the event that housing choice voucher or housing voucher programs can't be uh, utilized uh, to, for operating, to cover operating costs. Can transition to the next slide. And then we make the, uh, to sort of the related to that, we make the recommendation that folks be considering service funding. And this is the area where we've, uh, we, we understand that folks are struggling the, the most with identifying a strong and viable ongoing service funding mechanism. So we, we, ask, we encourage folks to dive into uh, the potential for local, state, and federal funding that can be leveraged to, to offer adequate service funding to meet the unique and complex needs of folks being uh, served in support of health can transition. And then we also, as part of this broader framework and what we're calling step five, uh, lift up the need to be partnering and identifying very early on experienced developers who are culturally responsive, uh, who have capacity to take on those moderate rehab uh, projects potentially with tenants in place. And I, I want to flag that one, especially as we've seen the hotels and motels be leveraged over the last year to uh, temporarily house folks in non-congregate shelter uh, in response to the pandemic. So in those cases, if the units or the, the real estate long-term will be transitioned over to permanent housing, the you have tenants in place, you have uh, sort of an added layer of complexity that you want to make sure your developers uh, are really up for uh, undertaking. In transition, and I am 
almost to the end here. Uh, I won't spend very much uh, time on this slide, but we, we'd be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the need to secure that buy-in and establish that uh, political will. And we've seen projects sort of fall apart where, where this, uh, this step is ignored. So securing that uh, multidisciplinary or securing buy-in and assembling that multidisciplinary team to address any impediments or uh, zoning or other challenges that may arise are particularly important if you're going to have a successful and viable product project in the end. And then the very final uh, sort of area that we highlighted in our framework is the sort of partner to the to the developer, which is identifying experienced providers. And I said earlier that that could and should be folks who are operating uh, emergency shelter in the event that you want to temporarily use the uh, acquired real estate for temporary shelter. CSH strongly encourages communities to think about acquisition and conversion straight over to permanent housing. So in that case, you wanna make sure that you are uh, being intentional and partnering with experienced providers that can meet the unique and complex services needs of uh, folks who are poised to, to go into supportive housing. And I know I've gone over, and I apologize by a couple minutes. We can advance to the very final slide. I know that was a whirlwind, a lot of content for folks who are interested in learning more about ways that CSH can offer support. We'll have our, um, our information, the contact information on the slide. Thank you very Thank much, you so for much, Mary. And I, I know that uh, CSH has been a leader going back to uh, when we were in the heart of the pandemic last year. You came out with a couple of really terrific uh, papers that helped a lot of people who did do hotel conversions last year to uh, know what they were looking at. So with that, I'd like to uh, shift to one of our examples, and that is from Hennepin County, Minneapolis, which is right across the river from my hometown of St. Paul, Minnesota, and uh, a good friend and colleague, uh, Julia Welly Ayers. Julia? Thank you, Mary. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, I'm Julia Welly Ayers from Hennepin County. I'm the Director of Housing Development and Finance. Um, and today I'll, I'll share a case study um, about one of the projects uh, we completed over the last year. So as Mary mentioned, Hennepin County is um, the largest county in Minnesota, and we are home to the city of Minneapolis. Like many other counties across the country, Hennepin um, started leasing hotel rooms. Um, in March 2020 to provide non-congregate shelter for folks who were homeless and at greatest risk of contracting uh, COVID-19. Ultimately, we leased almost 600 hotel rooms for this purpose. By May of 2020, uh, the county also sought and received approval from the county board to begin searching for hotels um, and other appropriate buildings that might be available for purchase. The county's goal in its acquisition in 2020 was to replace leasing expenses with capital expenses. Um, so that would, it would actually leave the county with some assets that could be repurposed for affordable housing. So we were thinking about this conversion from the very beginning. Um, I start with these images you can see here to demonstrate another part of Hennepin's story. Um, in Christmas 2019, before, um, when we still called the flu spreading around China the coronavirus, we didn't even know about COVID-19 yet, um, there was a terrible fire that destroyed a building called the Drake Hotel. The county contracted with the Drake for overflow shelter for families, but um, the Drake also rented out um, the rest of the rooms uh, week by week to folks who had some income but couldn't pass traditional tenant screening or they couldn't afford the thousand dollars monthly rent for a studio apartment. The, it was relatively easy in the end for the county to replace the overflow shelter at the Drake, but it took great resources and so many people and so many partners and so much um, hand wringing to rehouse the renters. For this group of people, we had a huge gap between what we call pay for stay shelter and permanent supportive housing. The Drake Hotel fire made crystal clear um, our great need to not only protect and preserve but also to develop more of what we call single room occupancy housing. So it was in this context in early 2020 that Hennepin County shopped around for properties to purchase for pandemic shelter that could also be converted to single room occupancy. So if we go to the next slide, um, Hennepin County ultimately purchased four properties. We purchased two motels 
uh, we purchased a downtown boutique hotel. And then we purchased this building you see here, which was actually a former treatment facility. Altogether, these were 165 units um, that we purchased. A few of them were used immediately for isolation for COVID-19. Um, others were filled immediately um, with people needing shelter. For this building in particular, um, Hennepin purchased this building in November 2020, leased it to an organization called Alliance Housing on December 1st, and then started moving in residence December 30th. We are a county. We do not typically work that fast. We were able to work that fast and had to work that fast because we needed to be able to offer shelter and housing to residents who are vulnerable. Um, Alliance Housing um, is an important part of this story. They are a nonprofit housing provider with a 30-year record of providing extremely low-cost housing. They work in LIHTC and housing infrastructure bonds and all of that, but their particular niche and expertise is in running rooming houses for people exiting homelessness. And they do so um, without dipping into a lot of the government financing. Alliance works to keep, it, keep its rents below 450 a month and only uses the loosest of tenant selection criteria. They have no on-site services in the bulk of their buildings, and they see an average of a four-year tenure for their residents. They're doing something right. So it's for that reason that we, um, we looked around the community, we um, used an RFP to try to find an operator for the building we purchased. Uh, in the end, we were very happy to select Alliance Housing, um, who was already doing this work throughout the community. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Um, is just a floor plan for the building, shows you really what, how simple it is. Um, again, this is not a hotel or a motel, but this is what we were looking for in other projects as we continue to purchase. This project in particular has 31 sleeping rooms, a shared bathroom and shower facilities on each floor. The residents, um, the renters share a large kitchen um, and laundry facilities in the basement. Um, and there is an on-site caretaker that lives in an efficiency unit on the main floor. Um, and again, there are no on-site services for this project. The renters all have um, individual leases and they maintain their housing independently. Go to the next slide. Um, so um, the way this project works now is uh, the Hennepin County has maintained ownership of the building. Um, we hold a capital reserve for the project in case of big, um, uh, you know, if the roof goes out, the county will provide um, the financing for those um, those repairs. Um, but beyond that, Alliance Housing um, leases the project from the county and serves as the legal landlord. For this project, the rents are set at $375 a month and there's no ongoing rental assistance. The project is able to cash flow with just the rents from renters. Um, the renters in this building are all low wage, working adults, um, and folks with social security income who can live independently. They were originally populated from folks exiting, <clears throat> exiting other pandemic shelters. Then they were um, uh, referred from our chronic by name list, our chronic homeless by name list. Um, and then we're also taking referrals from our shelter and outreach teams. Um, so everyone in the building essentially is experiencing homelessness, um, very much long-term homelessness. One of our favorite stories is there was somebody who used to sleep in the park across from Stevens Square. That was where he camped and used to wonder, wow, what, what if I could live in a place like that one day? And now that is his home. Um, next slide, please. Uh, I put a bunch of text on this slide just because I think this is the important piece of it. The, when the county set out with its acquisition co conversion project, we were looking very specifically to develop non-supportive housing. And that's because when Hennepin County did its analysis, as Mercedes suggested, when we did our analysis from the beginning in terms of what does the county need for its continuum, we found that we had a lot, like I said, we had a lot of pay for stay shelter where folks are paying a weekly rate just to stay in shelter. And we actually think we have a good amount of permanent supportive housing, although there are a lot of people in it who don't want or need that level of service. What we were missing was deeply affordable um, housing, which is accessible to folks with criminal histories, accessible to folks with um, whose income changes throughout the year, um, who just need a place to stay and who are independent and just want a dignified place with the key to their door. Um, so that is the focus of Hennepin County's um, acquisition conversion project. Again, Stephen Square Resident is a really great example and we're really happy about how well it's doing so far. 
Um, we are looking forward to converting our other three properties to housing as soon as we can. And we are looking for ways to do more of that at other properties. Um, the primary goal for us doing this, again, is completing our continuum to make sure that folks in Hennepin County who are most vulnerable and have the greatest disparities in health and income and housing have a full pathway to enjoy that full housing spectrum. Um, this is one of the primary ways that the county is looking to reduce disparities in Hennepin County. Um, one key point at the bottom of the slide here is that we believe that 20% of our shelter guests could afford these um, rents that we're talking about, um, but don't need or want permanent supportive housing. So again, if we can create housing opportunities for these individuals through um, conversion of other properties to single room occupancy, we'll create space in our shelters so that folks who currently um, are perhaps um, sleeping outdoors can come in and receive more enriched services. Uh, we'll go to our final slide. Um, so our next steps, um, just to highlight it, is that, you know, what we really want to do is develop enough permanent independent single room occupancy units so that no one has to use shelter as housing. Um, to do this, the Hennepin County Board commissioned a single room occupancy task force at the beginning of last year. Um, that task force will be sharing recommendations on how to develop more single room occupancy housing this fall. What I wanna say is everything Mercedes said was fantastic. Her toolkit is gonna to be fantastic. Um, our task force actually benefited from following a similar process with our, our exploration. So do whatever Mercedes says. Um, and our, so our initial goal for Hennepin County is we're thinking if we can build 1500 units, build, convert 1500 units of single room occupancy housing over the next 10 years, we won't have to have people with income using shelter as housing. The primary need I wanted to put in there too in that that the county's found so far is really engaging partners as operators. Um, it's a really big struggle to find special gems like Alliance Housing that um, are really comfortable with and excited with um, providing independent housing for folks with very low tenant selection criteria, um, but very high interest in relational property management. So I'll stop there. I know there's time for questions later, um, and I look forward to hearing from the rest of the presenters today. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much, Julia. And it's been such a pleasure to work with you over the years uh, in my housing journey. Uh, I do want to highlight for people that we've tried to find uh, examples of uh, projects that are different from each other, different focuses, and definitely this SRO focus in uh, Hennepin County is one uh, that I have not seen in a lot of places, but really has a lot of merit. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Kelly Ryder, who will talk to us about a really exciting piece of this hotels to housing picture, and that is a financing mechanism that King County, Washington has uh, brought to the table and in, is in the process of implementing. So Kelly, can't wait to hear your story. Thanks, Mary. Uh, as you said, I'm Kelly Ryder. I'm the Government Relations Manager for the King County Department of Community and Human Services. Uh, King County is the county where City of Seattle, Washington resides. Uh, so we are a region of 39 cities, including the Seattle Metropolitan Region, uh, and trying to do work across that. Uh, I'll talk to you a little bit today about our Health Through Housing Initiative, uh, which much like many of the uh, presenters today came about through the work that we did last year to de-intensify our congregate shelters uh, and be able to create more permanency for folks. Uh, so if we wanna to move to the next slide. Our Health Through Housing Initiative uh, is based on a needs assessment we actually did with CSH prior to COVID uh, that found that we needed 4,000, uh, 4,500 to, to 6,000 permanent supportive housing units. Uh, so chronic homelessness is very much a crisis in our region uh, that we are working to address. The ability for us to see the de-intensification of shelters and moving folks into single room settings uh, gave us the opportunity to find a way to move folks quickly in and be able to stabilize them. And so last year, uh, our King County Executive announced the Health Through Housing Initiative with the goal of housing 1,600 King County residents experiencing or at risk of chronic homelessness. And we are doing this by first acquiring single room settings like hotels uh, while economic conditions are favorable 
being able to put those buildings into immediate service as what we call emergency supportive housing. And then we are funding them with sustainable and long-term operations and services funding while we work to convert those units into full permanent supportive housing. Uh, since May of this year, we've been able to acquire five buildings for this portfolio, bringing us up to 535 units. Uh, and as Mary said, this backed by a very specific funding source. And so uh, our legislature right before COVID hit uh, gave us the authority to adopt councilmanically a one-tenth of 1% 1 sales tax. Uh, it was certainly a challenge to be able to discuss that sales tax in the midst uh, of what I imagine many of the country uh, was experiencing as our economic downturn. But in the face uh, of really severe and persistent chronic homelessness, uh, our county and uh, our county council and executive were able to put that into place so that we have about $50 million per year we are able to use on this effort. And it was adopted with an eight to one vote by our county council. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, so just a bit of more background and context about uh, what we're seeing in the King County region. Uh, we've been really a pioneer, I would say, in the permanent supportive housing effort, though I know many of you are probably working on that as well. Uh, 1811 Eastlake and DESC's work uh, is housed within uh, the King County region, and we're super proud of all the research that has come out showing what uh, an effective model that is to be able to bring folks into permanent housing and stabilize their health uh, and drive down costs of services like criminal justice and uh, public safety. Uh, we found out through the COVID experience just how much impact we could have even through a single room setting like a hotel room. And we've done some studies that's linked here uh, in the slide deck uh, through our University of Washington that uh, just reinforced how much we can improve folks' health by just bringing them into a single room setting, even if lacking uh, a full kitchen and a full housing unit. And so building on that, we did wanna capitalize on the current uh, hotel market uh, we found a temporary opportunity to make a lasting difference by being able to acquire hotels at a reduced cost and make them uh, make our resources go further. We also wanted to capture the speed with which we could impact our chronic homelessness population by being, bringing folks in immediately. Uh, I don't know about the rest of the country. Uh, right now, it's taking us about two years to be able to bring permanent supportive housing units online. Uh, We're working to move that as quickly as possible, uh, but funding is limited, land is limited. And so the ability to work with the properties that we have is gonna be able to speed up our work. If you wanna move to the next slide, thank you. Uh, we've really crafted, uh, as I've said, a very specific population here ingrained in the legislation that our county council adopt, adopted is a specific focus on our chronic homelessness population. We did that so that we are not peanut buttering around these funds. Uh, even our $50 million per year is going to go quickly uh, in our market. And so we are focused on being able to serve folks at or below 30% of area median income who are experiencing chronic homelessness. Our legislation does give us a little bit of leeway to be able to address those uh, who come up just a little bit short of the chronic homelessness 12 month mark, uh, but really focusing in on uh, populations that are experiencing disparities and disproportionalities. Uh, if you want to turn to the next slide. Uh, so this just gives a little bit of detail in our financial model just to show folks uh, if you're interested in really creating a sustainable model for ensuring that your program has everything that it needs, uh, we are focused on site acquisition that for us is around 200 to 300,000 per unit. We were able to announce today uh, a building that we were able to acquire for about 116,000 per unit. So there's a big variation. For us, total operations and services packages that include full case management and 24-7 staffing is coming up around $20,000 to $25,000 per unit per year. And so the tail on that is really um, challenging to be able to find a funding source that is big enough to get to scale. Uh, and this source for us, uh, be specifically because we don't have to renew it, uh, is able to really make sure that we can commit to that for the long term. Uh, so these contracts will come up for renewal, uh, but the funding source is really uh, set to ensure that these buildings are funded as long as we are serving this population. We're also working on being able to connect behavioral and physical health care, both on-site and through mobile interventions. Uh, and we're talking with folks about being able to do specific outreach in local communities to ensure that we're reaching the folks that need this housing the most. 
Uh, and then, as you can imagine, many of the hotels that we are specifically targeting uh, have very large parking lots. And so we'll be looking in the long term at being able to further develop on those properties, though that's not going to be something we'll be able to fund with this uh, funding source at this time. Next slide, please. Our building criteria, uh, I imagine, is very similar to what other folks will be looking through these buildings. Uh, there's a, a need for a very specific scale for permanent supportive housing to be able to balance uh, intensification of a population with high needs, as well as ensuring that we have uh, efficiency of scale for our service providers. We are specifically looking for uh, newer buildings so that we're not gonna have to invest heavily in them before folks can move in uh, or even in the short to um, medium term. The most important uh, challenge that we have had in our search is that in talking with our service providers, they've been very clear that they need buildings for this population that do not have external corridors or stairways. And so ensuring that we really have a boxed in building has been a critical component of our search. There's lots more buildings that would be available to us if we can look for those older garden style apartments. Uh, and that just hasn't been an option for us. If you wanna move to the next slide. Thank you. And so this is the portfolio that we have been able to acquire. Uh, typically, the county uses a process, uh, I imagine, much like many places where we solicit uh, providers to come in with proposals for buildings. Uh, our low income housing tax credits right now are completely tapped both for 9% and 4%. And so given that we are fully funding this, given the challenges of uh, competition in the hotel acquisition market, King County is acting as the acquisition uh, purchaser. And so far, we been able to purchase. Uh, this is our four buildings as of yesterday. Uh, as of today, we added a fifth building uh, in the city of Auburn and South King County uh, that brought our total up to 535 for our po portfolio. Uh, and we're hoping to have a few more to announce here in the next few weeks. Uh, if you go to the next slide is my last one. Thank you. Uh, and so Mercedes mentioned political will. Uh, for us, the uh, bringing on of de-intensified shelters in hotels across our region actually did hamper political will quite a bit. Uh, we acted very quickly in jurisdictions across King County uh, that weren't quite ready for us to be moving this population into those hotels. And so we had to be able to buy some of that political will back. Uh, in the long term, we think that the way we're implementing this is actually going to be uh, more successful uh, than our typical process. But because of uh, our specific situation, we made a very clear uh, commitment to cities across our region to bring them in as close partners and ensure that they gave us the green light. Uh, so for our implementation, implementation steps, uh, we reached out to cities to develop a relationship and a contact at the cities. We ensured uh, that they gave us the green light to start our search. Uh, and we used those building criteria to do that search. Uh, the next step then was to have the jurisdiction officially approve a site once we found one that was within our purchase uh, criteria. And then we are also partnering in community conversations. Uh, it's been very important to our cities to engage folks in the community, especially direct neighbors. Uh, I would encourage folks to also think through equity impacts of who you're engaging in community dialogue. Uh, and then lastly, we've been able to start partnering on the selection of providers, uh, and we know that they will be um, balancing the hiring of folks' uh, capacity for the service provision has been real challenging, and then be able to refer folks to lease up. Uh, happy to turn it back to you, Mary, and answer questions later. Thank you very much, Kelly. And I know since I first learned about this, um, really major uh, program that's funded not with federal dollars, but really with um, state permitted and locally decision dollars. Um, I've been watching to see uh, what the results will be. So congratulations, Kelly, to you and your colleagues. Next, I'd like to bring up a team of presenters to move us uh, to Texas. And that is Mary Margaret Lemons and Matt Rugging. Matt and Mary Margaret, take it away. Did you want to start with a video, Mary? Oh, yes, that's right. We, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot. Uh, we have a special treat today, and that is a short video from the mayor of Fort Worth uh, telling us about this important project. Hi, I'm Maddie Parker, mayor of Fort Worth, Texas. I want to thank each of you for your interest in how our city is curbing chronic homelessness. 
Fort Worth saw a remarkable 40% decline in homelessness in 2021. We attribute that improvement to effective collaboration among partner agencies, with Tarrant County Homeless Coalition as the lead agency. I'm thrilled to introduce a short video about Casa de Esperanza, a hotel conversion project completed in November by Fort Worth Housing Solutions in Ohio. This conversion was funded by federal CARES Act dollars, transforming 121 hotel rooms into 119 efficiency apartments and space for community and support services. This project has been a very successful project in stabilizing our residents. We have another 48 permanent supportive housing units currently under construction through a separate partnership, and we expect to see similar results. Homelessness is a complex issue. It takes true collaboration and help people gain self-sufficiency. Hi, I'm Maddie. A gentleman came in, one, one, ex, one experience that I had, and he said, I have been camping for the last eight years. He said, and now this was going to be my last year because I wouldn't make it through another winter. He said, and he was crying. It always makes me cry. But he was crying. He said, y'all saved my life. He said, y'all just, y'all have absolutely saved my life. Fort Worth Housing Solutions endeavors to build um, places where people can flourish. So that means homes in every part of Fort Worth. And Casa de Esperanza really speaks to our effort to try to help the most vulnerable of our citizens. Casa de Esperanza is really a success story of a number of different governmental, for-profit and non-profit agencies coming together with the singular goal of utilizing a CARES Act grant to acquire an existing hotel and convert it to permanent supportive housing that supports those who have been chronically homeless for a 12 month period. This is the only COVID vulnerable permanent supportive housing project I know about nationwide. There are lots of permanent supportive housing projects, but none with this COVID specific angle. The most challenging aspect of the Casa de Esperanza project was the timing associated with it. After being selected a development partner from the city, and closing on the property on October 1st, we then had 60 to 75 days to fully renovate the entire property, including the units, business office, common areas, leaving only about two weeks to lease 120 units to the permanent supportive housing tenants. We needed to uh, overlay existing housing stock with transit corridors. There was this communication with city, with, with housing agencies, with um, uh, housing advocates. And I think we looked at over 150 properties before zeroing in on this particular one. The renovation process was extremely complicated here. There was no amenity space, no business lounge, no offices. It was only hotel rooms as well as a very small leasing office. We actually demolished five residential units in order to create an open tenant lounge. We actually removed a 2000 square foot commercial laundry facility and turned it into a break room as well as five different offices for all of the case management workers who are providing the supportive services for the residents. We also renovated all 120 previous hotel rooms. And so all of the rooms received new appliances, paint, furniture, welcome baskets, which included bed linen, sheets, silverware, and really everything that you would need if you were to come off the street and move into um, housing. I was happy. The first thing I did was sit in the shower for about two hours. <laughs> it, it's just great and to be able to do the things that I, I want to do and, and to start working on my goals that I have set forth for myself. It's been an uplifting experience for me and it's been very humbling for me to be able to say I have a home. You know, I have my own home now. The beauty in Fort Worth and in Tarrant County is that we do this collaboratively. We don't depend on government to just do it all. We come together as a team and get the job done. We work with Tarrant County Housing Solutions Coalition, 
Presbyterian Night Shelter, Union Gospel Mission, Salvation Army. JPS Health Network and a number of different other people that worked day and night to make this happen in a tight time frame. I think the rewarding aspect is that this particular project takes 119 people off the street at least and gets them into permanent supportive housing where they have wraparound services from healthcare to job counseling to education if they need it. And to be able to see that, to offer that during this pandemic when people are really at risk is a real heartwarming thing to see. I think if we can just switch back to the PowerPoint, we can, the video really says it all. There's not a whole lot we have to add, but we can um, show you a few slides on our timeline and, and talk a little bit more about the details, so. Mary Margaret, while we're waiting, I know there was one question uh, in the Q and A about uh, transportation at this site because some of the uh, some of the uh, shots indicated this uh, is not in the middle of the city. Can you just answer that question real quickly? Absolutely. So we are really lucky to work with a developer partner that saw this opportunity or really early on, and so back um, in March. Matt and I had a conversation about hotels and, and the hospitality industry maybe being a possibility for us to expand into to help this population. And so they had already started to overlay possible extended stay hotels on our transportation network. And we were lucky enough to find this one that has um, a covered bus stop literally at the, at the um, driveway in, entrance. And so it's on our um, Trinity Metro, which is our transit authority's um, route. And we have, um, you know, service right to the property. Great, thank you very much. Sure, thanks, Mary. So these are just a few, a few slides. The video really um, says says it all. I, I love being able to hear directly from residents. But um, the housing authority was able to partner with one of our um, developers here that we've done several projects with to um, apply for an RFP from the city to access nine point two million dollars in CARES funding for the purchase and rehabilitation of this extended stay hotel. Um, it's actually in a council district that is not necessarily the one we would always go to first for affordable housing. We get a little bit of pushback in that area, but um, we had early outreach to both um, the elected officials as well as the um, neighboring property owners. And it doesn't have any um, residential property that necessarily is adjacent, but we did reach out to all um, neighborhood associations that were close by just to let them know. And by getting them, getting their buy-in early, we had literally no opposition when this uh, project went to city council. So you can go ahead and um, advance the slides. So this was a, a before picture. Um, it was a, a extended stay hotel that was occupied. So we did have to do um, URA um, relocation um, at the property. And um, we worked with our staff as well as um, on-site property management and Matt staff over at Ohala to make that happen so we could get it emptied, rehabbed, and then um, leased back up. Yeah, and Mary Margaret, I can speak to that a little bit. I know um, the timeline and some of that criteria was important here. So um, Ohala, this was a little atypical for us to be in partnership with. We generally are not in the business of uh, a permanent support of housing, but when this opportunity came up, it was it was very clear that the, the limiting factors here were both were, were really just time and money. Um, time because we had to spend the money uh, by year end and occupy units. Money we had a finite amount of it. Um, so knowing those two things, we we went on a hunt for. Uh, it was almost a needle in a haystack. There were over 150 uh, hotels across the city that I guess we could have spent time on, but we knew that. Uh, there were a couple of critical things. One, the, we needed the, um, uh, the kitchenettes and units from a timing perspective. We knew we needed to be on a transit corridor, on a bus line. Uh, we knew we needed to be in a 
uh, in a commercial area that was going to have minimal pushback. Um, and, and we knew that that zoning and other criteria were of critical importance. So, so though, yes, there are a lot of hotels across the city, there were very, very few uh, that hit that criteria, plus had a willing seller um, willing to entertain the idea of, of acquiring one of his properties to convert to, to homelessness. Fortunately, um, we were able to pull all of those pieces together within a very tight time frame with Mary Margaret and her team uh, to identify, acquire, renovate, and, and convert this particular property. You can go ahead and advance the slides. I think the next thing might be your timeline you're talking about. <laughs> yes, that, that, there it is. So even though this timeline starts at August, when, when, when Mary Margaret uh, reached out to us, it was earlier in the year. So we, we, were, we were already in process of identifying or, uh, or, 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 or redlining areas that we, we couldn't go to um, crossing those off. And so um, it, here's the very, very quick uh, time frame in which we were able to, to acquire, uh, rezone, um, relocate, renovate and move in residents. And I would say it really took all the partners. So we worked very closely with our local COC to use our coordinated entry list and our street outreach teams to identify the residents and get them document ready um, when possible and, and locate them and get them to the property. So it was a lot of people working towards a goal. We had weekly meetings, if not daily conference calls to make sure that everybody was on target. And I really hand, um, or I, I tip my hat and, and give all the praise to Matt's staff who really lived at that property almost 24 hours a day to make sure that the renovation was gonna happen on time um, through the holidays. And so we literally started moving people in right around Thanksgiving and we were leasing people up right, right through the, the Christmas holiday. So probably can advance to the next slide. And then maybe the next one. So these are just some after pictures. We've learned through other experiences with permanent supportive housing that the community space and the, the caseworkers are key to making this a sustainable project. And so we partnered with our local um, hospital here, our county hospital, JPS, for a medical liaison to be there full, full time, as well as a um, mental health and substance abuse counselor from our MHMR partner, and then three caseworkers from Presbyterian Night Shelter to be on site full-time. So five full-time caseworkers are office there. Um, and then we do have a, a community space that has, you know, a room to gather and to hold events and, and um, get people out of their units, as well as a dog park, an outdoor space, and a, a raised garden bed for some outdoor activity for our residents. So um, we were able to, to do all of that within the budget that of the $9.2 million. And then um, the city has... Um, paid for the services for the first two years, and we are continuing to add value with um, fencing in the property, as well as some, some additional in-unit upgrades um, for the next two years. And then we expect that the vouchers will be able to handle the case management expenses on an ongoing basis. Next slide, please. So these are some, some after shots. Um, what has made this really successful as well as these units are completely, they're furnished. They had the welcome basket so people could come in from the street. Um, we had about 50% campers and 50% of our residents came from the shelters. Um, Wi-Fi is included and TVs are mounted in every unit as well. So um, it really is a, a plug and play. Um, you can be very happy there um, just as soon as you, you don't, you don't need anything when you come. So next slide. Matt, do you want to talk about some of the work you guys did to, to make it look like that? <laughs> um, it, it was quite a, it, quite extensive. The, the The condition of the property itself was was not great upon purchase. You know, we had a limited budget, um, so we could not buy um, a a downtown luxury high rise property. Um, the The conditions of the interiors were were, were very bad. Um, mold, other items we had to deal with. Um, Fortunately, not, not too much structural or other mechanical items, but we did have to open up walls. We had to reinforce certain um, um, components, obviously paint, um, amenity space, the interiors, as you saw the before and after photos of. Um, subsequent to this photo, we've, we've uh, uh, gated the perimeter of the building um, to provide some additional security. Uh, and you can see here also, as, as Mary Margaret mentioned, um, some outdoor spaces, dog park, gardens, um, uh, 
you can see the front of the building. There's some meeting areas and spaces to, to give a sense of community for, for the residents. That was important to us here. And I, we can also report, you know, over seven months in, we've not had um, turnover. So we unfortunately lost one of our residents. Um, he passed away. But other than that, we've had 100% occupancy with the, the same tenants that moved in, um, you know, back in November and December. So next slide. So that's when you heard Ella at the very beginning of the video talking about the gentleman that said he wouldn't have lasted um, another year on the streets. This is um, this is that gentleman, and um, we're just really happy we were able to complete this project before the winter storm Uri hit Texas because we experienced temperatures and conditions that we don't typically, and we know that that could have really negatively impacted um, our our friends that were on the street at that time. Next slide. So this was Christmas Eve, we were able to bring a hot meal out. Um, and we obviously with COVID precautions, we, we uh, delivered them to doors, but then also were able to have people gather outside um, and just share in some fellowship and, and let people know that uh, we were excited to have them as our residents. So we had uh, council members and all kinds of um, you know, stakeholders join in for the day and, and give back to our residents. So great day. Tried to make up some time for you, Mary. Thank you very much, Mary Margaret and Matt. And uh, thank you for sharing yep. that, that inspiring story. Um, thanks to all of our panelists and um, all of you as listeners across the country now face the challenge uh, and the opportunity uh, to plan for your states and communities for how you can mobilize some upcoming federal and hopefully state and local resources to create housing for people who are homeless. That's the mission uh, that caused us to uh, put on this webinar and to challenge you to action in your communities. The American Relief Plan, ARP, that was passed by Congress in March provides both the home ARP program, which is a special $5 billion appropriation to the home program at HUD. Uh, and right now HUD is working on uh, guidance for the implementation of that program. And we will put in the chat a place where you can sign up on the HUD Exchange website so that you can get information. Uh, HUD is providing technical assistance sessions. And while they're prohibited from talking about what the specific guidelines will be while they're under development, uh, they will be providing information as it is available. So uh, I do encourage you, it is $5 billion that has already been allocated out uh, to uh, entitlement communities, uh, participating jurisdictions. So if you're not already thinking about that, um, I encourage you to do so. The goal of this webinar is um, to encourage you to be thinking about existing buildings that may be able to come online as housing uh, more quickly and at a lower cost than you're able to do new construction. And don't think you're limited to hotels. One of the projects that you saw from Julia is actually a property that was an underutilized uh, uh, shelter facility that was used for uh, young people who were drug addicted that were being treated and uh, that program was combined with another uh, property. Think things like nursing homes, dormitories, and convents even. Uh, those are all examples that have been uh, converted in, in the last year or so. The other thing to remember is that this solution is not a panacea. Uh, the results suggest that it warrants a serious review and looking back at that checklist that Mercedes presented early in our presentation is strongly recommended. Finally, and if I could have the slide up, I would appreciate that. Um, the National Alliance to End Homelessness, who I've worked with for the last six months, has recently introduced a web page that will be dedicated to information about hotel to housing conversions. And um, they have uh, uh, funded 
the development of a series of case studies, which uh, uh, several of which are already posted on that website. Uh, last month, uh, the National Housing Conference hosted a previous webinar where we heard the case studies from uh, California, Vermont, and Oregon, all of which uh, used funding last year to acquire uh, hotel properties throughout communities in, in those three states. And those uh, case studies with a lot of detail about how they were done, a list of the actual projects that were funded uh, can be found at the link that you see on the screen now and in the chat. Um, over the next couple of weeks, uh, the Alliance will also be posting uh, case studies for uh, Hennepin County, uh, which uh, Julia worked with me on, and then several uh, project level case studies, including uh, the Casa de Esperanza project that you just uh, heard about. So I really do encourage you to visit the website. Uh, a lot of people volunteered a lot of time to make the case studies possible. And uh, I really encourage you as you're thinking about your communities uh, looking at those for assistance. And now we'll move into uh, the Q&A session. So if you haven't already uh, submitted a question uh, that you'd like to see, uh, please uh, click on the Q&A at the toolbar at the bottom and put your questions there. That'll be easier for us than uh, putting them in the chat. Um, but to get the ball rolling, um, I think we'll uh, proceed with one question. And I'll throw this out to um, Mary Margaret first. Um, what were your biggest challenges in financing these projects? And maybe uh, we could have the speakers uh, in the gallery view for this uh, particular part of the discussion. Well, honestly, um, you know, we had a lump sum. They did an R the city did an RFP for $9.2 million that was made available. So we were limited on the amount of work and rehab we could do, but you know, having that lump sum made it very easy. We knew that we could at least acquire and do what was necessary to get at least up. The ongoing capital improvements and maintenance are gonna be um, what will have to be funded out of the operations from, from vouchers. So um, I, would, I would say not, we, were, we felt very lucky because we typically don't see such large investments into PSH um, in our community. So this was a, a nice surprise for us. Very good. And uh, Julia, any, uh, what were the biggest challenges uh, stories for us? Um, for the county, yeah, we were lucky um, to have this big moment where we were already using so many county dollars and CARES dollars to lease hotels, where when we offered the proposition of let's buy it instead and actually have an asset, that was a, a, a justification and argument that made a lot of sense to our county board. Um, like Mary Margaret said, the ongoing uh, re rehab repairs is another thing altogether. And so we are now looking at um, how do we have shared capital reserves for any projects that the county is holding ownership of. And that, that's a primary strategy we're working on going forward. Great. And Matt, you uh, joined us on the camera. So I'm guessing you might want to comment on what the biggest challenges were as you looked at those 150 opportunities. <laughs> Yeah, I think um, it, it, just the confluence of a willing seller, um, an appropriately located property, and a property with the appropriate bones to um, allow for such a conversion, um, combined with uh, the financial components of it. We, we didn't have a carte blanche uh, checkbook to go spend hundreds of millions of dollars. We had a finite budget and um, there were very few, very few um, opportunities that presented themselves with all that criteria. Very good. And, and Matt, I know you look at a lot of uh, commercial buildings in your other work, and I know we had a question in the Q&A of, well, what about other things that aren't hotels? Um, do you, can you think of some roadblocks that might keep some of those other types of buildings, like office buildings, from being a very practical choice? To, to reprogram an office building to include a number of, you know, bathrooms, walls, things of that nature, um, it could present challenges. You know, early in the pandemic, uh, when there was some uncertainty as it related to school enrollments, 
um, we, we were considering or looking at the conversion of dormitories um, to potential affordable housing um, or permanent supportive housing. Uh, unfortunately, in that regard, or I guess fortunately, uh, enrollment has spiked back up and there haven't been, we'll say, stressed or de-stressed opportunities to acquire stuff like that to convert as um, the values of those properties have shot back up significantly. Great, thank you. And Kelly, you're in the process of buying buildings right now. Anything you wanna to add to the challenges? Yeah, I touched a little bit on the challenges of the politics with the jurisdictions uh, that really allowed us to change drastically how we would usually use that process. Um, and I think those changes then uh, have left us really changing a lot. And so figuring out how we hold on to what we've really learned historically and building on the successes of more traditional permanent supportive housing development, while also trying to make use of this opportunity and make changes uh, that are really gonna benefit people's lives has been one of the tensions we're trying to continue to balance. Great. And Mercedes, I wanna um, ask you a question. A lot of people say to me as I talk to them about this work, well, isn't, haven't we missed the boat on this opportunity with uh, hotel conversions? Because after all, people are starting to come back to hotels. What are you telling people that you're working with about whether there's still opportunity available? Yeah, that's a really good question. Thanks for throwing it my way, Mary. I will start by saying this. While hotel conversions to supportive housing and affordable housing are becoming really popular, right? Because it's a really nice and more affordable way to fast track and accelerate housing production. It's not new, right? So part of what we've been uh, sort of including in our common messaging across the country is just that it is, right? Encouraging folks to look to, and I'm super stoked to have your the National Alliance case studies be a reference point for folks to look to around some of these exciting projects. But there are folks who are well experienced across the country that have been using this mechanism for some time. I, I do think that what folks can maybe look forward to in the future and what we're even already beginning to see is that, and it sort of ties back to a point that Matt made about lo location, willing seller, good bones, right? Like uh, proximity to services. As the industry starts to see a spike in room reservations and you may not be unable to identify a seller with a property in a prime location, it may make the uh, availability of those most ideal real estate, or I'll say in this case, hotels uh, a little bit more limited. But what we're starting to see is folks are just willing and, and, uh, and have experienced so much over the pandemic that they're still ready to get out of the business, even though they do have enough taken reservations. They are seeing folks uh, returned uh, to their business. They're, they're, they're still just interested in uh, disinvesting and pulling out of the business entirely. That we've seen play out in a couple communities that we're having a little bit of a back and forth uh, with a willing and an unwilling seller over time and then ultimately a seller that said, I'm out. And again, we only have a handful of anecdotal uh, sort of uh, examples to draw upon, but it does feel to me like there isn't this opportunity that the opportunity is, is here and present more than ever. And uh, quite frankly, there are folks that were doing this pre-pandemic. Right, and thank you, Mercedes. Uh, I saw that one question we had in the Q&A was uh, when Kelly was speaking of, well, well, how did you get these at a reduced price? And I think that's maybe one of the uh, misconceptions about uh, what it takes to do a uh, hotel conversion into housing. You won't necessarily want to buy the lowest priced hotel that comes your way. In fact, you almost certainly will not want to buy the lowest price one that comes your way. You may have to pay something similar to what that hotel would go for as a hotel, but when you combine it with um, perhaps a very modest amount of rehab, uh, like you saw at Casa de Esperanza, you may find that that is still a package that costs you less than building new construction. Even in California, even in an expensive place like San Diego, where they bought an almost brand new residence in. So an extended stay hotel did very modest rehab. 
they came in at over $100,000 less per unit than it would have cost to build new. So I think um, if you're going into this saying, well, we're going to get hotels really cheap, uh, and that's your motivation, that that's probably not the path you want to take. And Julie, I remember when you and I first talked that when word first got out that the county, a public entity, might be looking for hotels, uh, you got an awful lot of them that uh, you really didn't want to look at. Absolutely. Do you want to say a little bit about that? Sure, yeah, Mary. And uh, similar to the other presenters, we had set out our parameters. We want this. You know, we wanted buildings that were smaller than 100 units. We wanted buildings that were close to amenities, such as a Walgreens or a Target. Um, we wanted these specific things uh, for the buildings, and we um, had very wide variety of offers. You could buy this for me. Wouldn't that be great for your um, project? Um, and sometimes we wanted to jump on them because what a great deal they actually want to sell to us. But in the end, I'm very glad that we stuck with our priorities, which was these smaller buildings that could more readily convert to um, permanent housing in the end. Very and I good. totally agree with you that purchasing even a, a 20 year old, 10 year old hotel is a lot cheaper than buying new. Um, so. <laughs> And Kelly, you're in the market right now, and I think Mary Margaret, you may be as well. Are, are you still seeing opportunities that are suitable? We are. I will say uh, we do think that the market for, uh, for actual hotel tourism is starting to increase and it's uh, reducing the interest of the sellers. Uh, I do think it goes back to the points that you and Mercedes were making around this is still a really important tool to have in our toolbox. Uh, so the hotel that we just closed on uh, last week, we were able to get for uh, a third of what we would typically pay for uh, permanent supportive housing uh, development new construction. Um, we're probably not going to be able to find those, you know, all over the map for the next few weeks uh, and years. But every building that we get means that more residents can move in more quickly. Right. And Mary Margaret, any further comments on this? No, our city's making additional, as they get additional funding in, they're making more funds available. So we always have our eye out for potential properties. But like Matt said, being able to find the properties that meet all the criteria is getting harder and harder. So um, I don't know that we'll be as successful, but for sure our price per unit is less than half of what it would have been to build new construction. And so, um, you know, paying a little bit more on the front end really is, is okay because we couldn't do this um, if we were going, you know, ground up construction. Great. All right, Henry, I'm going to ask you if you have a couple more questions uh, teed up for us. Henry, you're on mute. Yes, thanks. I just realized that. Um, <clears throat> uh, one question I had specifically for uh, Julia um, is just, are there, are there lessons that um, in Hennepin, Hennepin County or, you know, other, other um, similar jurisdictions you might be familiar with that you've learned um, in terms of doing really quick turnarounds uh, in light of uh, the COVID pandemic? Um, you know I, know, I know we've talked about timelines here. Some people have mentioned, you know, it, it can often take upwards of two years and yet you guys did it pretty quickly. Um, so I'm just wondering if you can speak a little bit to, to that and how you accelerated the process there. Thanks, Henry. You know, what I would say is um, the timeline that Mary Margaret and Matt presented from Fort Worth was exactly what ours looked like, um, where it was essentially from the moment we told the board we're thinking about this, um, we bought it two months later and then moved residents in about 30 days later. Um, I think uh, what that comes down to is having flexible funds around, right? So um, HUD home dollars, it'll probably never work, right? But if you have a flexible fund, like a property tax, um, you know, fund that's just an acquisition fund for this purpose, um, or again, ARP set aside for this purpose, such as in a qualified census tract where you have fewer hoops to go through, um, having that fund available, getting early board approval for the concept was something we did. We went to the board in May and said, we think we want to do this. We think we want, I think we said something like um, $30 million. We want to set that aside. We want that to play with, with acquisitions over the coming months. 
Um, and then we had constant communication with the board so they wouldn't be scared or nervous when things came up. You're nodding, Mary Margaret. So then when we did have an acquisition, it wasn't a surprise and they knew it was coming. They were actually really excited and hungry for it. And then of course, um, lots of project management crashing going on where we were doing inspections and walkthroughs and um, negotiations all at the same time. But I think a lot of it was really just the political conversations talking with neighborhood groups when it, when it was even a twinkle in our eyes. Uh, those were all things that we did. Sure, that makes sense. Um, and then I'll I'll direct this one at Kelly, but I know that this is you know this is going to be applicable to all to everyone here. Um, so please feel free to free to chime in. But I'm I'm curious about um, there was a question in the Q and A about um, environmental review, which I know um, you know that's often something that is used either intentionally or unintentionally to trip up projects like this. It can often lead to you know increased costs. Um, it leads to significant delays. How did environmental review um, requests play into the conversion of these properties? And then more broadly, what other sort of zoning related challenges did, did um, everyone encounter when, when um, going through this process? Thanks, Henry. Uh, I will take King County's pretty quickly because we are still early in the process uh, and others may have more to share. We have just acquired the properties and now we'll be working through the permitting permitting process with local jurisdictions. We're hoping that because this is current construction and we won't be doing a lot of heavy rehab in the beginning that we'll be able to work through existing regulations. Uh, also because we're using our own dedicated sales tax, we don't have to comply with a lot of the typical uh, federal fund source environmental regulations uh, and things like that. So we are still learning uh, no bumps in the path so far, uh, but we'll see what happens. Sure. And if anyone else wants to, oh, oh, go ahead, Mary. Henry, uh, one thing I'll add to that from uh, the case of California and Oregon. So California, when they decided in uh, the summer of uh, 2020, so a year ago, that they were going to allocate over $500 million to uh, hotel to housing conversion in California, their state legislature actually put in a provision that uh, basically made uh, these conversions as of right within existing zoning laws, as long as they met certain very specific criteria that they were part of Project Home Key, et cetera. And that was a very important uh, provision for them. And um, also, I know that Oregon, which has a, a state-funded program, uh, did not originally have that, uh, that provision in their state law, uh, but later went back and got it, which allowed, uh, I think, four or five projects that had been a little bit stymied uh, by local zoning codes uh, were actually allowed to move forward. So uh, it's not insignificant, but there are also a number of projects, particularly in Vermont, uh, in the Vermont case study that moved forward, uh, despite the fact that they did not have an exemption. With regard to the um, environmental, I would just say, uh, I think two things. One is it's going to be very state specific because state laws vary widely on uh, environmental reviews, but it's also going to be very uh, funding resource specific. And so to the extent that you might be working on state or local funding uh, initiatives, um, probably wouldn't be a bad idea to explore with your policymakers, whether they'd be willing to uh, provide uh, certain very specific waivers to environmental that would be suitable because you are going directly from a type of residential use to another type of residential use uh, so that might be something uh, to consider if you're in the planning process for a policy initiative. Sure. Um, and then I'll, I'll just wrap up with one more, um, you know, and this is looking a little bit more towards the long term. Um, we, we did get a few questions just about uh, making sure that the properties are kept up in a way that uh, past uh, supportive housing properties have not been, you know, I'm, we're, we're familiar with the ways that um, you know, many other properties have deteriorated, especially when um, funding sources have dried up. Um, so what are, the, what are the ways that we're, you know, working to ensure the long-term viability of these properties? I, I suspect that a lot of it has to do with 
you know, being close to amenities, being on transit lines, stuff like that. But I'm wondering if there's, you know, some more hidden stuff, some more, op op you know, operation side stuff that uh, that it would be helpful to explore here. And I'll I'll direct that to Mercedes and Mary Margaret, just because I haven't asked them anything yet. But feel anybody feel free to answer that. I mean, that was a big concern of ours, and that's the reason we were so um, happy when the project was awarded project-based vouchers. Because of that ongoing operating income, we're going to be able to um, not only maintain the property, but to add um, amenities and to reinvest into, into the property. So we, um, we have a standard at Fort Worth Housing Solutions that, you know, we wouldn't want to own a property that any of us wouldn't feel proud to live in, and that's kind of our, our standard across the board. And, um, you know, we plan on, on reinvesting either in this property or in other permanent supportive um, housing properties that we own with any funding that is um, in excess for, for this operation. Mercedes, do you want to add? Yeah, and I have to apologize. I did fall off audio, <laughs> so my apologies. I missed the beginning of Mary Margaret's response. That would have been nice to hear. I'll, I'll just flag this, and, and she probably covered it a lot better than I can. One thing that we uh, flagged for Henry and for all is just the folks really be intentional around establishing a strong, viable operating funding source. Uh, if you're unable to secure enough operating funding uh, through available uh, voucher programs and other more innovative funding, identifying potential for standing up new funding sources. We've heard already earlier about uh, funding that was initiated outside of state and federal funding that can be used on the capital side. There's opportunities to do that in the services side as well. To Mary Margaret's point, to ensure that housing is high quality, right? And it, it, it is maintained as such and in such a manner that any of us would be proud to, to occupy those units. So that's all I can offer just at a really high level, not being on the ground, um, putting these deals together and ensuring that there is a sustainable structural operating funding source other than to make the recommendation that there are opportunities to take the same approach that we've seen to identifying capital and service funding to identify uh, sustainable ongoing uh, operating funding as well. If I may, if we have time, Mary, I just want to reinforce this point. I think we are seeing, um, and I think it's probably a national trend, a huge challenge with retaining and recruiting employees for, for service providers that are serving these buildings and our ability to be able to provide that sustainable funding in a way that actually inflates over time to be able to keep pace with operating costs, I think is critical. Uh, all of the folks that are there supporting our buildings uh, love to show up for a ribbon cutting, uh, but keeping them committed to that building 20 years later when they, they say, hey, what happened? Why didn't this stay you know, in good shape is so much harder. And so the more we can do, I think nationwide to be able to support funding streams that really allow for that full staffing and that keeps pace with those costs is gonna be what I think secures the maintenance uh, and the great asset for the community over time. All right, Luke. I want you to take us home. Uh, yes, uh, just briefly, uh, just thank everyone, uh, the panelists for relating your projects and, and the time you took this afternoon to answer audience questions. Um, obviously we weren't able to get to all the questions. Um, so uh, NHC staff will be sending out uh, responses to the questions that we got in the Q&A to registrants of the webinar. Uh, just a couple of uh, housekeeping things. Um, uh, obviously, thank you, Mary. Um, not that that's a housekeeping thing, but thank you, Mary, for um, <laughs> for your continued collaboration on this series, um, and uh, you know the the work that you mentioned, um, your case studies. We will be sending that out as well. Um, the presentations and the webinar uh, recording will will be available on our website, NHC's website. That's nhc.com, um, and in the next couple of days. Um, I think I'm mistaken, it's nhc.org. Um, and lastly, uh, one of the things you heard um, was the importance of the low-income housing tax credit uh, as an important funding source to maintain the permanent affordability of these hotel and motel conversion programs. Uh, on September 2nd, we will be doing a, uh, a webinar um, on Senator Cantwell's bipartisan bill, the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act. And we'll be looking at the implications of that um, of that bill for the production of affordable housing. So stay tuned for that. That'll happen on September 2nd. 
Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it off to our president and CEO. Um, thank you, David. That's uh, nhc.org. Um, I'll pass it to uh, our president and CEO, David Dorkin, for um, final closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Luke. Uh, all the incredibly hard work. Uh, thank you, Nan, uh, from our board, Nan Roman. Uh, we, we could not do this kind of work without you, um, as is true with many of us uh, on the call. And I just wanted to say this is an incredibly important issue, and uh, I really appreciate everybody's commitment to it. Um, NHC is celebrating our 90th anniversary this year. Uh, we were founded in 1931. And uh, I do encourage you to check out our website. And um, if you're not a member, we'd love to have you join. We have a lot of different um, ways to do that. And um, I just want to say, and I just want to say, um, we really appreciate everybody's um, involvement um, and all of our panelists. So thank you.